Man, come on. There you go. You even got a... I remember all of you who didn't clap for me. That's uh, Anyway. All right, hold on. We got it. It's, it's ever shifting and changing around here. So. Yeah, yeah. There's a prayer night. Come pray. This, this, this Wednesday, it's June. There we go. June 20. See, there's always something going on. I promise you one day we'll get all of our ducks in a row. It'll be the day that Jesus returns. Amen. Okay. June 28. June 28. June 20. Go. June 20. June 20. There we go. Night of prayer. June 28 is going to be from 6 to 7. That's this coming Wednesday night. So you go, what, what are we doing for a night of prayer? We're coming here and we're praying. Specifically what we're praying for is we're, we're going to open up a series this morning on deliverance. So if you need prayer, I'd come Wednesday night. Amen. Maybe you don't need prayer, but you want to come pray and be a part of that anyway. We're, we're praying for revival and reformation and all those things uh, to happen in the Grand Valley, to happen in the state of Colorado, uh, to happen at 970 Church. And there's a lot of other church prayer voices that we will be uniting with our own uh, in order to come in and be a part of that and come see what God is doing. Um, and how many of you know you never have enough prayer? Amen. Amen. About half of you. Okay, we'll pray for the other half. No problem. All right. I want you to turn real quick to Isaiah chapter 61, and uh, we, we've got a couple things this morning that I want to get to. Um, Eric doesn't have this, so you're going to have to go like old-fashioned, grab your Bible, grab your phone, Isaiah chapter 61, because I want us to understand this was part of the ministry that Jesus did. This is also part of the ministry that Jesus commissioned us and gave us authority into, and we'll explain a little bit deeper here in just a minute. But he says this, and he quotes this in Matthew and in Luke. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. And I understand this is not socioeconomic poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. If you don't have this written down somewhere, underlined, highlighted in your Bible, in your scripture, in your app, whatever it may be, you need to write this down, write this address down, underline this if you're comfortable writing in your Bible. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. He has sent me to proclaim cap freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance for our God to comfort all those who mourn and to provide those for grief in Zion to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning and a garment of praise instead of the spirit of despair. Well, they will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Okay. Why did I read that? I'm glad you asked. I'm just sitting right underneath the swamp cooler, so that's why I'm tacking everything down up here. And don't turn it off. Just whoever, don't go there. Just leave it on. You are the apple of his eye. You, in, in a parable in Matthew chapter 13, verse 45, 46-ish, he talks about, well, it's going to be really clear now. He talks about that the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is like finding a pearl of great value. And that when the merchant found the pearl, he sold everything he had so that he could buy the field that the pearl was in. You're the pearl. You go, why are we talking about this? We're talking about deliverance. I'm, I'm glad you asked. You have his gaze. He is mesmerized by you. Jesus, his son, was the purchase price for you, the pearl. In other words, beloved, you're worth it. You're worth it. You're worth it. So everything that we unpack for the next four weeks... Jesus purchased and said, it's for you. Amen? Okay. How did we get here? Let me just review for real quick. Two weeks ago, we were in our series in the book of Acts, and we're still there. But we need to camp out here to understand some things. Because Acts is not done. 
But we got to we got to unpack what it means to be delivered and what it means to be set free because a lot of times we have let Hollywood define what deliverance is and that and, and there's an actual narrative and an agenda that's being pushed that says the devil is somehow a match for the Lord. And I just want to let you know, no. no it's not, it is not even a contest. It's not a bet. It's not even a battle. It's like you walking up to a flea and flicking it right off the table. There's, there's really not a contest in that. Amen? Okay. You have His favor. And He has sent Jesus to already do what I read out of Isaiah chapter 61. In other words, with the shed blood of His, shed His blood on the cross, living from the finished work of the cross, over. They go, well, why do we still have the stuff that we have to deal with sometimes? Because one of the descriptions for the enemy is called the lawless one. Satan and, and the demons if, that we're going to talk about today, they are legalists. In other words, if you give them an inch, they're going to take a mile. If you've got an open door, they're going to occupy a room. If you've got an open window, they're going to occupy a wing. Why? Because that's how they work. Let's get into this a little bit. In Acts chapter, I believe it's 16, was where we last left off in Acts. Paul has a, a, a demon-possessed girl following him around. She has what the Bible reveals to us as a python spirit or a spirit that enables her to tell the future. And for three to four days, we're told a couple of days, Paul finally has it up to here with the spirit proclaiming momentarily the truth. And he turns and he rebukes her rebukes it out of her okay so we need to understand that part of deliverance that we're talking about today okay and for the next couple weeks right is defined as this it's using the authority of Jesus to deliver people from demonic activity using the authority of Jesus to deliver people from demonic activity now I want you to raise your hand if you're a people Get, you're qualified on both counts to both deliver and be delivered. Yay! In other words, if there's some area of your life that is under demonic activity, you qualify. Okay? Let's, let's take a couple of, of scriptures here in the ministry of Christ to understand that deliverance is a part of a full gospel ministry. This is underneath our review real quick. Mark chapter 3, 14 and 15, read something in a minute. He <laughs> We'll get it live. There we go. He <laughs> I could have read it, but it had been tough. He appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. Verse 15, and to have authority to drive out demons. Matthew chapter 10, 7 and 8, read this. As you go, proclaim this message, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. And then he says this, freely you've received, freely give. Acts chapter 10, verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and he went around doing good, healing all who were under the power of the devil. Excuse me, underneath the power of the devil, because God was with him. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8 reads this, but well, the one who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Deliverance or getting out of, praying people with people to get out of a demonic stronghold or any demonic activity in their life, okay, is a part of full gospel ministry. Jesus, well, let me, let me say it like this. There's a, a misnomer that the church has taught when we say saved. Because we came at it from a, a, a Greek word or a Latin word called salvo, and it's actually the word sozo. We changed the word because we didn't like that translation, and I'm not going to get into the translative history, because I will completely nerd out on you for the next 30 minutes, and it's not important. <laughs> amen? <laughs> amen. 
<laughs> Some of you are like, I didn't show up for history class. You did, but you didn't. Sozo, sozo is the word used in the Gospels for salvation. Sozo doesn't just mean saved. If you've hung around 970 Church, you know this. I've shared this many times. It will, continue. It will be in our DNA. Sozo means saved, delivered, healed, whole. So when you and I came into relationship or lordship or however you'd like to couch it this morning with Jesus, done. Goes on to say, you're a new creation. Paul would say that in Corinthians. Saved, healed, delivered, whole. Now, what I want you to do during the next like 30 minutes is this. Start asking the Holy Spirit. Start asking the Father. Honest assessment, current condition. Is there a part or a piece of my life that might be under some activity that I, that I know everybody wants to be, well, I don't want to be possessed. We're going to unpack that here in a few minutes. But it just may not line up with the Word of God. This is politically correct as I can say it. Okay, if you want the God's honest truth, it's this. Is there a part of me that's still underneath the influence of a former master? Oh. You, uh -huh. Okay, good. Here we go. Jesus called deliverance. This is the new stuff. Jesus called deliverance the children's bread. If you've got Mark chapter 7, Eric, thank you so much. This woman was a Greek. She was born in Syria and Phoenicia. Your translation might say she was, Syria, she, was, she was from Syria or she is a Syrian Phoenician. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First, let the children eat all they want, Jesus told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Verse 28 says, Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Here's what I want to highlight. Jesus is not calling her a dog. It's an expression. Okay, what he's using here, if you miss this, it sounds like Jesus is very misogynist. And that's not what he is. What he's simply telling her with the expression is, you don't qualify for the children's bread because you're not a child. I love her response. Verse 28 is her response. She said, you want to talk about being bold before the Lord? This was her response. Put it back up there for me, Eric, in verse 28. Lord, she replied, she didn't mislabel this she understood who he was amen even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs and if you read verse the verse 29 he goes wow that's amazing faith i'm paraphrasing wow that's amazing faith go your daughter's been healed did you a couple of highlights out of this story the daughter's not even present another another thing is this no one laid hands on the daughter and jesus just speaks the word She's been healed or she's set free and it's done. I'm, I'm hoping that this connects with you because a lot of you are like, uh-huh. I have no idea what we're talking about, but I like it. Okay, we'll start with that. We'll, 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 we're good with that. It's not that he's not able. What, what the thing is, is what makes her ineligible is that she's not actually an Israelite. She's not a children yet. Now, we're going to get to where they all are, or we all are. Jesus gave believers, sons and daughters, authority to minister. If you look at Mark chapter 16 and 17, it reads this. And these sons, so this is after Jesus has gone to the cross. He has been buried, he has resurrected, and now he's about to ascend. And these sons will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. We just stop right there. Are you a believer? Two people raised their hand. Five people nodded their heads. Look, this is the participant. Are you? I need you to understand. Are you a believer this morning? If you're raising your hand, what does that verse qualify you to do? Drive out demons. Congratulations. You're all on the ministry team. Yay! You are commissioned by the authority of Christ to do this. Some of you are like, I didn't sign up for that. I just don't want to go to hell. Okay, in all fairness, in all fairness, you're selling yourself just a wee bit short. 
just a, just a little bit short of everything that God has called you into. And I, I understand, I, I don't want to go to hell either. <laughs> However, growing up in maturing in faith also means growing up and maturing in the calling and in the sons and daughters part of understanding relationship. Yep. Amen? Okay. In the early church, deliverance was also a part of water baptism. So if you're, if you're taking notes this morning, this would be a note I would take. This would be a part of the understanding because we're actually going to start to see where this thing deviated. Okay? So many believers were actually coming out of pagan worship. When we look at Acts and what Paul's having to confront, in Acts, in Corinthians, in Romans, pretty much those epistles that he wrote in the New Testament, the establishment of the early church, a lot of those new believers were Gentiles, so they didn't have a Jewish background. They had a Gentile background, and here's what they did. When you would go, when you need, let's just use this example. When you needed a good crop, because you were a farmer, you would go find the appropriate God to worship to have a good crop. Okay? Does this make sense? You would go to that temple and you would do whatever that temple priest or priestess would tell you to do. Now, that having been said, it's not like what you and I would think of necessarily by following the temple priest or priestess because part of the worship to the God that you needed the favor from oftentimes included temple prostitution yes we need to talk about this it involved having sex with temple prostitutes both men and women male and female okay it also involved making vows it also involved sacrifices it also involved drinking the blood of whatever you did sacrifice you these are all early forms of pagan worship. So, all of a sudden, here comes the gospel. And if you were a Gentile, you had made all these vows and promises, and even some of them covenants, with pagan idols. And I realize some of us go, well, they didn't speak. Oh, yeah, hold on a second. Because if you were to fully participate in some of the rituals... You were drinking yourself into a state of oblivion where your, your nature or your subconscious was altered or you were participating in, in what we'll just call controlled substances. I'm trying to be as nice as I can. Because I realize like we live in the state of Colorado. And some of you are going, it's a controlled substance. If we're participating in any form of controlled substance abuse that brings us to a state of altered conscious, let me tell you what happened spiritually. You just blew your front door wide open for the enemy. Am I saying that drinking is wrong? No. The Bible says don't be given over to drunkenness. Does that, everybody understand that? If I need to, I'll turn and face the wall so that no one gets offended because I might be looking at somebody, right? Just understand, it says don't be given over to drunkenness. It doesn't say don't drink. In the same context, Paul tells Timothy, you should probably have some red wine for your heart. <laughs> so just he says don't be given to drunkenness. And the reason why was because pagan and idol worship, in order for them to commune with the thing that was knocking on the other side of the door, which was not the Holy Spirit, they were hearing something. Yep. Something was talking back. Are you with me? Yep. When we play, I know we're like, I'm all over the map this morning, but understand, this is a big broad subject, and what we started with, with two weeks, and kind of the sermon planning, we're now at four. <laughs> because there's some things that I can't get to this morning, but have to be talked about. They were opening themselves up and they had to because that was how the demon communicated what he needed to communicate in order for you to do what you needed to get. Amen? You understand that? Okay. That's what a lot of the believers were coming out of. 
you go back to 375 AD, you have Hermes, Tertullian, Arrhenius, Martin Luther, the reformist, and his wrote down in his little book of baptism that the officiant shall blow three times into the child's eyes and shall say, depart that one clean spirit. What am I saying? I'm saying this, is that when believers would come, when Gentile believers would now become believers and they went to get water baptized, they had to deal with, they had to go through the car wash. Is it, you okay with this? It's a crude analogy, but it's like, I got a new car. What do you need to do? Well, if in Grand Junction you go to the car wash, inevitably within 24 hours, we get rain. Praise the Lord. Okay? As a believer, sometimes you need to go through the car wash. Because here's the thing. A lot of times when we start talking, when we start to talk about getting saved, we don't have this whole understanding of healed, delivered, set free, whole. We have, oh, I'm not going to hell. Which is great. Don't get me wrong. However, there's just more to the word than that. Right? And because we're conditioned in churches to have about, you know, a 90 minute service, and I'm only allowed to talk for maybe 40 of it, right? How many of you know? I just can't get to everything, which is why we now have a month of deliverance. Amen. I'm, I'll work with what you give me. Amen. Okay? And the reason why you go, well, you can go longer. We have kids here, we have kids' workers here. That's not fair. We didn't prepare lunch for him anyway. Let's keep going. Today the Lutheran church renounces, even today the Lutheran church still renounces the devil. Anglican background includes the rite of exorcism with holy baptism in, included in the Anglican book of common prayer. What I'm simply pointing to is this. The deliverance and the prayer for freedoms or the prayers for freedom were included in water baptism all through the early church. Okay, where did it go wrong or where did it go south or when did we start leaving it out? And wouldn't you know, there's a lovely gentleman, we'll just leave his background because when as soon as I mention his name, a lot of you are going to pick up on it. But there was a monk that was a part of a denomination, and we'll leave it at that, named Thomas Aquinas, who decided that he would start mixing, mixing, mixing excuse me, Christianity with Aristotle rationale. That's a mixture of law and grace. I want you to understand something about the Lord. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways, finish it for me, are not our ways. We're talking about trying to understand from a logic and rationale perspective the creator of the universe who about the time we think we have everything figured out, likes to do what? <laughs> about the time we put God in a box, because we got God figured out, and we got Him in our box, what does He like to do? He likes to blow all four sides and the lid off the box. And go, how about them apples? Why? Because the Lord is relational. And here's what happened. They developed a Christianity that was based off of Scripture, which is not bad, but also Aristotle rationale. And what they failed to understand is that power flows from relationship, not doctrine. And what actually happened was they embraced a doctrine and theology that denied healing and deliverance. One of the things that that I have to stop and I have to check myself and my attitude and the whole nine yards is because when people say, God doesn't do any more healing. Dear Lord Almighty. In the South, we say it like this. God bless your little heart. And then we invite you, just have a seat. Let me find you one real quick. No, that makes your lips melt off your face because how many of you have experienced healing at 970 Church? Amen. Like a physical thing in one way. And I, we could stand up here and tell testimonies all the time, but we would run out of, we'd, we'd quickly run out of time. We have to be careful that we don't embrace a theology or a doctrine that denies the power of the Lord. Otherwise, we inadvertently start embracing a doctrine and a theology that says the cross wasn't necessary. 
and that what Jesus did on the cross wasn't necessary. One of the, I have a mentor who regularly, like, the Lord just called him to minister freedom and deliverance. And that's all he does. It's, it's all he does. He attends a church, he's faithful, he does all the things, but when he, and he's on the prayer team. And when he walks up and he ministers to people, um, there's just several different models and different things that happen. We can get into that stuff later. I would just simply say this. There was one time he was invited to come to a person's house who literally had uh, an unclean spirit in their dwelling place. Now, how many of you know that would get your attention? Okay, and when you say unclean spirit, like you saw things or you heard things, or okay, not the normal bumps and, and settling that your house does underneath temperature or weather. Pictures knocked off the wall. That kind of stuff. That's serious stuff. And he walked in with his prayer partner. And this was one of the first things that got my attention. Because the Holy Spirit told him, it's that old Catholic cross that's hanging up above the candles. Now, I'm not here to pick a fight with denominations. It's the finished work of the cross. And this Catholic cross depicted Jesus still on the cross demons are legalists you are not by having Jesus still on the cross you're denying the finished work of the cross well, wait a minute no -uh. here's what he here's the advice he gave them I'm gonna pray for you and I'm gonna pray over your house if you don't take that down this thing's not gonna leave How many of you would be like, it's down, it's out. It's burning in the bin in the backyard, right? We're done. She took it down. Everything stopped. What happened next was interesting. The enemy showed up in a very unique way through some family members who then immediately attacked her for their culture and their background and it being Catholicism. When you go for freedom that Jesus has said go for and Jesus has given us access to, not everybody's going to be excited about it. Okay. You all right? I don't have any jokes to read in between stuff this morning. You're just going to have to. We're in the deep end of the pool. And here's the thing. Everybody has their life preserver on. But we're not done. Because the next three weeks, at least the next three weeks, I'm going to take you deeper every time. Okay? So just want you to know this. Deliverance, and this is another point I would write down. I didn't number these. I don't want you to think in number terms. I just want you to understand as I give you an overview of where the ocean is and what this thing looks like. Deliverance is daily ministry. It's not necessarily just a special one-time thing where you go through and you get delivered and all of a sudden you're good. No, it's, it's sometimes it's getting delivered and, and we're going to title the last sermon in this series called Staying Free. Because it's not enough to get free, you need to know how to stay free. I told you last week the story of one of our kids. They were just really wrestling with what I would call night terrors. And if you don't know what a night terror is, it's a nightmare on steroids. And, it, 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 and it's a demonic, it's a spiritual attack. And I can describe a couple of things that bring commonness uh, or a under, common understanding to what this is. Excuse me, a lot of times it's where you feel unnaturally or supernaturally cold that doesn't make any sense. You feel like there is a thousand pound blanket on top of you and it's pushing you into your mattress or your bed. And you, you feel like your lips are shut or glued together. And you realize this is not a natural feeling. And once the enemy has you pinned, so kind of physically and yet subconsciously at the same time, um, th that's when there are a lot of times dreams of death, dreams of dying, dreams of being killed, dreams of killing people. Those are night terrors. Okay? Okay? To have them means 
Beloved, there's a part that's underneath demonic activity. We'll talk about open doors later. One of our kids was experiencing some of that and was sensing there is something dark in the room. And I shared with you last week, it's one thing for me as the dad and the spiritual authority over my house to go in and deal with it. And I told you last week, it doesn't matter if it's a, it's a spider or an alligator with a machete. I'm going in there and take no prisoners, give no quarter. You got to go. You got to die. We're done. We're not dealing with that. Okay? But instead, one of the things that I've learned is this. Bring the person with you. So I grabbed one of them by the, I grabbed this one by the hand. And I said, come on, we're going in here together. Because you don't, nest, you don't have to need me all the time to operate in the authority that the Father has given you. You're a son underneath the kingdom of God, just like Daddy is. And they went, okay. I know you think like it's Jack or it's Ellie, you're trying to, let me just put it this way. Your kids have the same authority you do. Do they need you? Yes. I mean, for crying out loud, we just talked about Father. By the way, I was told that Mother's Day was a complete shattered disappointment compared to what last week was with Father's Day. <laughs> so I apologize to all the ladies who did, not get, who did not get what the fathers got on Mother's Day. That's what happened when a dad and a father preaches Father's Day. And I mean, it was, if you didn't watch it, I know I'm biased. It was me preaching. You should go watch it. I got blessed the second time I watched it. Amen. I thought that guy's good. Amen. Deliverance is daily ministry. It does, you don't need to... Now, modeling, understand something. You don't always have time for a three-day fast to go deal with darkness. You just got to deal with it where it is and where you're at. Okay? There's become a... We've developed specialists... And the reason we've had to develop specialists is because the church hasn't walked in the authority that she's been given. Number one. Number two, this is another reason why we've had to develop specialists. It's because we're, we don't want to have to try to explain logically and rationale something that's happening in the supernatural realm. Well, why does a demon knock things off the wall? I don't know. And when you go, you should ask it, no don't no Eileen no we'll talk about it later about why you should or shouldn't do that and I'm just going to tell you right now well Jesus talked to one well beloved none of us are Jesus I'm just going to be straight up on are we all prescribing and aiming that yes absolutely please I don't think Jesus was asking the demon what his name was I think Jesus was asking the man what his name was and the demon responded because he's trying to intimidate the Lord. Good luck with that, by the way. It didn't work out then. It still doesn't work out today. All right. One of the things about this is our language has become divisive and confusing. Okay. So if you've, if you've hung around 970 Church... There are translations that one a point one points towards the concept idea of possession. Okay, and that that means that we are giving um, credence to a demon having physical spiritual possession over something. Okay, that's fine because it is in a translation. However, the translations you got to go back further than that because there's another translation that use, it doesn't use the word possess, it uses the word oppress. So we go from having hold of, possessing, to oppressing, like wearing something like a heavy yoke across your shoulders or your, your head, okay, or a part of you. That, listen, I'm okay with those, but what I'm telling you is this. It's, it's actually divisive, and it's confusing. Because the next part is, and this is a really important part of the question, is can a Christian be underneath the influence of demonic activity? And some of you are like, 
Yeah. Have you met my family? That's enough. I don't... <laughs> you go, well, wait a minute. How is that possible? We're going to talk about it this morning in just a few minutes. Translations can read two differing words, one meaning, opos- one meaning possessed and the other one meaning oppressed. The original language used in Mark chapter 7 and Matthew chapter 8, would, and I'm, I'm talking about the original language used is they had an unclean spirit. Not the unclean spirit had them. They had an unclean spirit. Matthew chapter 8 is where Jesus approaches the, the we'll, we, we commonly know it and recognize it as Jesus dealing with legion. We'll, we'll unpack that here in a few weeks. The common biblical word is this word called daemonizomai. And I'm, I'm pronouncing it that way so that you can kind of pick up on the spelling. It's D-A-I, and in apostrophe write E if you're taking notes. D-A-I apostrophe E. I'm not tonight. <laughs> the reason why I'm highlighting that spelling is because probably over the last 25, maybe 30 years, I know that commonly our kids have come into contact with things that promote not demons, but daemon. By the way, don't take this out on anyone named Damon. But instead of it being called demons or being spelled D-E-M-O-N, it's spelled D-A-I-M-O-N or D-A-E-M-O-N. It's tied directly to this root word. You don't have to look very hard. You don't have to look very long. You can put it in your Google machine and stuff will pop up. But the word is daemonizomai. Now, here's one of the things that we need to understand about this word that's used in Scripture is it doesn't mean possessed and oppressed. Okay? It actually is used in contact, context of a little, medium, or a lot. So, you can have a little demonic activity in your life. You can have a medium level of a demonic activity in your life. Or you can be like the guy with Legion and the Geradines in that region and have a lot of demonic activity in your life. I'm the only one that found it funny. Okay, fine, whatever. You can have a little, it's kind of like ordering a pizza. It's like a small, medium, or large. You can have a little demonic activity. You can have a medium level of demonic activity. Or you can have a lot of level of demonic activity. Right? Right? A Christian can have demonic activity in their life. Okay. I am not looking at, if I look at you, I am not looking at you. I'm just making eye contact with different people in the room. You all right? Okay. When we got saved, we hopefully... We're okay with the fire insurance. We're not going to hell anymore. We said yes to a relationship with Jesus. We said yes to his lordship. Good? Spiritual maturity and becoming mature sons of God and daughters means going through sometimes and letting the Lord and Jesus heal stuff that happened. Okay? Now, let me be transparent with you. When I was a kid, I was about eight, nine years old. And for two years, I was was sexually molested. Okay? Now, I, I I don't have a problem sharing that with you. And the reason why is because I took Jesus back to my past with me, and he healed some things. So much so that when this person had their own child, lost their own child in a horrific horse riding accident, I'm able to pray for them, bless them, and continue to forgive them. Now, I want you to highlight something. Continue to forgive. One of the biggest strongholds 
that the enemy likes to hang out in in Christians, in believers' life is in this area of bitterness and unforgiveness. It's a giant, you, you are living in the Tower of London. And the problem is you got no keys and no doors out. And you are not in there alone. You, you starting to get the picture? Forgiveness is oftentimes, and I have million. we have at least five messages on the website on forgiveness. The latest one we did was about a year and a half ago called Forgiven. So if you need one, 970.church, go to the ar- sermon archive, you'll find it in there. But forgiveness a lot of times is like exercise. I know I just used the e-cuss word and you're not with me anymore. But forgiveness is a lot like exercise. Sometimes it requires me to forgive more than once. And I have to build that up and keep exercising that. And every time I choose to exercise that, and then any time I choose to follow Jesus' directive, and not just forgiveness, but praying for them, and even blessing them, I'm, I'm literally with Holy Spirit by my side, we're literally tearing down the stronghold of bitterness and unforgiveness. And here's the thing. It doesn't just have to be the big things that we are holding on to. If you're a human being, there's a high likelihood you've probably experienced hurt. Raise your hand if you're a human being. Okay. So, congratulations, we're all qualified to experience hurt. Some of the hurts are teeny tiny little splinters that left untaken care of over time become big deals. Some hurts are trauma. Like, it didn't just hurt a part of you, it hurt the whole thing, and we would call that like a soul wound. It affected not just how you behaved, it affected how you think. It see it let me put it this way. Hurt is like wearing a pair of glasses, and all you see is that perspective from that lens. It can be true and it can be true of little things and big things, okay? That's just one of the places the enemy likes to go hide in the life of a believer, is in the area of unforgiveness, is in the area of bitterness. If we'll deal with it, you'll get a pearl. So you aren't just a pearl. Now you'll get a pearl. All right, I'm the only one that's impressed with that. Fine, whatever. (laughs) The question is this, and has been for a while now. If you're a believer and you're full of the Holy Spirit, then how can we come underneath demonic influence? Okay, a lot of times, Big C Church has gotten away from the public or the private, even practicing baptism of the Holy Spirit. Turns out, that's necessary. It's like you've been given the keys, holy moly, I'm out of time. It's like you've been given the keys to a great big old mansion. You alright? You've been given the keys to a mansion and you're walking through the house and maybe sometimes you're leaving some doors and some windows open to the outside. And what salvation does is it goes and it shuts all the doors that are leading to the outside and it shuts all the windows that are leading to the outside. And, and maybe those strongholds or those things or those lies that we've come into agreement with, we inadvertently pop the door open or lift the window up. You ever walked into your house one time after coming back from vacation and discovered you had an intruder? Did you just let the intruder stay? You go, well, no. No. There's a lot of things I want to say right now. I'll just leave it alone. (laughs) But you didn't let the intruder stay. So, beloved, why would we let the intruder continue to stay in a spiritual home? This thing right here. One of the disturbing things about it is I don't know what to fill my home up with if that thing leaves. 
So now you want to keep it around because you're lonely? I love you. Tell me how this makes sense. I love you. Tell you how this makes sense. I would rather live with the intruder in my home than be alone. That's what we just said. And it sounds just as incredulous when you say it as when I do. Are we full? I don't mean are you full of it. Are you full of the Holy Spirit? And here's what I want to, before you say, well, yes, I spoke in tongues. I like, you gave me the coffee mug and the t-shirt and I bought you. No, we leak. We leak. I believe it was D.L. Moody. It is a quote I've quoted in the past. He, he says we leak. We leak. And if we're not constantly underneath the flow and being filled with the Holy Spirit, then we're not full. If we're not full, then we might have an opening somewhere. Ephesians chapter 4, 26 through 27 points to an open door. In your anger, do not sin. Don't let the sun go down while you're angry. Verse 27, it says this, to get, and do not give the devil a foothold. Anger left unchecked is a foothold or an open door for the enemy to come walking right on through with. You all right? Okay, remember, if I'm looking at you, I'm not looking at you. I'm just looking at you. I'm not saying this is you. I'm just looking at you. It's awkward if I just turn and stare at the drum set. The drum set did nothing wrong. Let me give you some of the most common open doors. And I'm talking about open doors in humanity, not just in the life of a believer. Anger. We talked about bitterness. Substance abuse. Meaning altered state of consciousness, consciousness was how the pagans communed with the gods. If you're drinking yourself... Or, or, and I would even say participating in the use of THC in, any many, in many of its various forms into a state of oblivion, that's altered conscience. Sexual sin, opening up soul ties. One of the, one of the obvious ones and one of the ways that they would do this back in the, in the first century church with pagan rituals was when they told you you had to go have sex with the temple prostitute Okay, the problem was this, is now that's a spiritual tie or a soul tie that you've made and the two becoming one flesh. Okay? Another one is movies. You're like, whoa, wait just a second. You're dabbling in legalism. Hold on a second. If I'm drawing spiritual connection and relationship with Jesus from a movie or if I'm getting a spiritual dimension or an insight about the demonic from a movie that's an open door you don't need holy water nope. does it help? I don't know I've never needed it and all the times that we've done deliverance and we've cast things out of people and one of the biggest ones was we have a couple there in ministry. They were with us early on, early, early on in ministry. And I think they're going to be here in September for our Sons and Daughters Conference. She had been sexually abused through an incestual relationship. On top of that, she found herself, because, well, I should say this, because that was never dealt with. You all right? Because that was never dealt with, she found herself in an affair with a married pastor. The devil comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Yep. And just because you think, well, I'm not a Christian, or I just have fire insurance, or I'm just, I just barely qualify, no, beloved, you bear the image of the one Creator who created you in, the image, in His image and His likeness, which means just by you being human, 
you're already a target. By the time she got to Kate and I, she was, she was possessed or oppressed or demonized by a spirit that would literally throw her into a seizure. Comes right out of Scripture. Freaked the secretary of the church right out. She wanted nothing to do with ministry internships after that. Boy, she was done. My assistant director looked at me and goes, I don't think it's physical or I don't think it's just physical. I think this is spiritual. Do you know what the stronghold was in this Christian's life? Unforgiveness. She had a hard and rightly so. Understand something. Forgiveness is hard in some cases. Not in every case, but in a lot of cases, forgiveness is hard. She had to forgive the family member who sexually abused her before she could see freedom. When you go, wait a minute, she was a Christian. Uh huh. Sang on the worship team. <laughs> don't, don't make any associations. I'm just telling you right now. And you're like, well, that's not in the Bible. Oh, yeah, it is. We come underneath the influence of this thing. Yeah, all right. Movies, TV shows, even video games. Like you, and I'm just going to tell you right now, parents, if you're a parent in the room, I love you. Man, just, just know what they're watching and know what they're playing with. That's our job. And I realize that if you're a teenager and you're a student and you're, you don't like me at all, and I can just tell you, I was in your shoes and I get it. And you want to see what you can get away with and you want to be cool and you want to do all these things. Here's the thing. I love you. You're already accepted in, with the Father. And the acceptance, a lot of times, that you're crying out for and you're looking for is coming from people who don't have any idea who they are. Let me tell you, let me give you one example. I'm, gonna dial, I'm dialing this one down. And the reason I'm dialing this one down is because this one has a particular generational curse with it. Now, before you go, well, in Galatians, Jesus dealt with all the generational curses. Yes, He did. But if you didn't walk through that door, door and access that it's possible the door ain't closed okay one of the biggest one of the biggest open doors and one of the and you can see this in the life of believers and I'll give you a big example here in just a few minutes is the masonic temples and I'd even include witchcraft okay if you're a mason I'm not attacking you nope I'm not I'm telling you you're involved in something, you may not know what you're involved with. So let's just pull the lid off, or let's pull the curtain back, and let's have the talk. It's demonic and it's generational. Here's what I mean. You ever seen the Mason symbol thing? In addition to it being essentially what looks like an upside down, or excuse me, uh, the anarchy sign, the big G in the middle of that sucker stands for the grand architect this is how deception it is we think well the grand architect that has to be referring to God well here's how the Mason first levels defined the Lord I don't mean Yahweh but a mixture they call it Jabulon J-A-B-U-L-O-N and it's a combination of three different gods the first one is Yahweh the second one is Baal. The third one is On, or Osiris, which is the Egyptian sun god. I can't make this up if I tried. The very first thing you do is you pledge allegiance to Jabulon, which is a mixture of three different religions or three different cults. Two different cults, depending on what you do with Yahweh. By the 18th degree, it's morphed into embracing witchcraft and Kabbalah. And along those 17 other levels that you just went from, you are making covenant and vows all along the way. By the thir down to the third generation, some of the fourth generation stuff. By the way, do you know where that model came from? 
right here. Satan doesn't need to be creative. He just needs to copy what God's already done. By the 30th degree, you believe in reincarnation. By the 32nd degree, you have made covenant and oath with Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, which are all Indian god, Hindu gods. Wait a minute. I thought we were talking about the grand architect. No. Beloved, you have no. Uh-uh. As a shriner, you are worshiping Allah and taking an oath to Him. Have I got your attention yet? By the 33rd degree, you are actually declaring Lucifer is God. And you have come into agreement with a death wish if you violate any of those oaths or covenants. You want to know, and this, there are books, I would recommend this book, we'll talk about it here in just a second. There are several books that are written about uh, Masons, Freemasonry, and coming out of Freemasonry. One of the, in studying this and looking at the demonic and deliverance part of it, one of the things that was alarming was there are statistics that show people down to the third and fourth generation dying abnormally of heart attack and prostate cancer. Generationally. Abnormally, abnormal, premature death having to do with heart attack and prostate cancer. One of our heroes in the faith, he pastors James River Church. He's, he, is, he had free mate, or does, he, he, the curse ended with him. His name's Pastor John Lindell. John had Freemasonry on both his mother's side, on his mother's side of the family and on his father's side of the family. Do you know what his dad died from? Prostate cancer. Do you know how many times his dad had prostate cancer? Three. John himself had prostate cancer. Went in, had the procedure done. Almost died from an infection from the prostate cancer. By the way, you can find this in his messages in James River Church. Almost died, comes out, and ends up with a heart issue that when you're preaching to 30,000 plus people, it would elevate over 220 beats per minute. And how many of you know, you just have to lay down until it passes. One of, one of his leaders in the church was explaining the situation to an evangelist in North Carolina. An evangelist in North Carolina said, it's due to Freemasonry and put him on the phone. I'm going to pray for him right now and it's going to be broken off. Done. It goes generational because you're making generational curses and vows that go all the way down. Two books I want to recommend to you this morning. I'm going to close. The first one is this, and this is where you can find a lot of the Freemasonry stuff. It's called The Biblical Guidebook to Deliverance. This is by Dr. Randy Clark. He's with Global Awakening. We have some relationship with these guys. If, you, if you're needing a book, if you want more explanatory stuff, this is a great resource. The other one, he's also associated with Global Awakening. This is called Liberated. And this is by Rodney Hogue. What I find ironic, both of those guys were Baptists. And as the Lord, as they started walking through ministry, they realized there is a Holy Spirit. He has a real job. My job is to co-union and co-labor with Him. There is healing available. There is deliverance and ministry set free available through. All right, so I've, I've given you, we've all jumped into the deep end of the pool, and I've given you kind of an idea of what the pool looks like, and we drilled down on one thing, Okay. The thing that we drilled down on was that there are sometimes there are things that are generational and there are things that are not generational. I'm not here. Don't come up to me and go, Pastor, this, the first thing I want you to do is this. Honest assessment, current condition. What is the Holy Spirit telling you? What is the voice of the Father saying to you about this? The problem with coming to me after service is not that I don't want to pray with you. It's not that I don't want to connect with you or hear your story. No, I do. 
The problem is, is if you come to me and you make me the spiritual authority in the matter. Well, you said it wasn't. No, no, no. What is the Father saying? What is the Holy Spirit saying? Can you bow your head and close your eyes this morning? It says in your word in Galatians, it was for freedom you set us free. It was for freedom that you set us free. Father, I thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. I thank you for the precious blood that was shed and that established a new covenant. For the reality and the truth of the statement, oh precious is the flow, that makes me white as snow. There's no other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Father, I believe right now you are speaking to your children. There is an honest assessment of current condition. There are things that are happening right now at a spiritual level that are not necessarily seen physically. It was for freedom that you set us free. As we dive deeper, I pray that you, Holy Spirit, would continue to to break the yoke of bondage off of your people. And that you would reveal areas that we might have some demonic activity taking place. And that you might reveal what freedom looks like. Father, I pray right now down to the third and fourth generation. If there's somebody in here that you're dealing with witchcraft and you're dealing with Freemasonry. We bind and rebuke those spirits right now in the name of Jesus. Because you ain't just dealing with one, honey. Father, we renounce any vows that we've made. And the blood of Jesus breaks every covenant the second that we came into covenant relationship with him. We serve notice and evict the intruder in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would shut every door and every window. Lord, I think some of us just have a revelation right now that we need to go through the car wash and we need to make sure that we have our our house in secure and in order. And Lord, I pray that over the next couple of weeks, you would just continue to minister that clarity that we would not not back away, not shy away from being honest and open with you. knowing that Jesus has paid it all. I bless 970 Church, those that are here with us this morning, those that are watching later, those that are joining us online right now. Isaiah chapter 40. That you would make the crooked path straight, and that you would bring the low place high and the high place up. The low place up and the high place low. That it would be a stable walk with you in order that the glory of the Lord might be revealed in sons and daughters. Thank you. We bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me give you some instruction. Don't want two pieces. Just hold tight for a second. The first one is this. If you sense there's something more going on and you want prayer, we're here. You can track us down email, Facebook message, 
or my cell number or Pastor Bo's cell number. We will keep it completely anonymous, but we minister as a pair. So whoever you contact, realize both of us are likely to be there. I almost promise you. Okay? And that, that goes from now and for the rest of the three, four, five weeks, whatever. If you're not comfortable and you don't know us, that's fine. There's a couple people that I would highlight to you and I would just tell you to go see them or we'll, get, we'll arrange contact that you can pray with them or they can pray with you for that as well. The second thing is this. We're going to take about a four minute. I know, it's four. I got you four minutes. Four minutes. Use the restroom. Peruse the merchandise over here. There's some desserts that they're putting out or they're going to start putting out here in a few minutes. Okay? If you need prayer, come find us after service. We'll get you the contact information. Get up, use the restroom. They're going to start putting desserts out. And we'll get the dessert auction going here in about five minutes. Absolutely. Okay.